Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the fire at the four courts in Dublin. My name is Geneva Morse, Vice President of Education and Programming here at American Ancestors, New England Historic Genealogical Society. I will be your moderator for today's session. This program is brought to you by the Brew Family Learning Center. American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer such programming for our members and friends around the world. Our presenter today is senior genealogist Rhonda McClure. Rhonda is a nationally recognized professional genealogist and lecturer before joining American Ancestors in 2006. She ran her own genealogical business for 18 years. She was a contributing editor for Heritage Quest magazine, Biography magazine, and was a contributor to the History Channel magazine and American History magazine. In addition to numerous articles, she is the author of 12 books, including the award-winning the Complete Idiot's Guide to Online Genealogy, Finding Your Famous and Infamous Ancestors, and Digitizing Your Family History. She's also the editor of the recently released sixth edition of the Genealogist Handbook for New England Research. Her areas of expertise include immigration and naturalization, late 19th and early 20th century urban research, federal records, New England, Midwest, Southern German, Italian, Scottish, Irish, French Canadian and New Brunswick research. Now, centuries of Irish history were lost as a result of the Four Courts fire in Dublin in 1922. Today, we'll delve into the history leading up to that devastating event. We'll discuss how it affected Irish, or it has affected Irish family history research for the last 100 years. And we'll also shine a light on record alternatives and survivals and a new initiative to create a virtual public records office. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type your questions into the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. We'll address those at the end. There is a syllabus available for purchase at our online bookstore. You should find a link to it in your reminder email and in the follow-up email that we'll be sending out later today. We're also recording this event and starting tomorrow you can freely go back and review any of the content from this presentation on our website as well as our YouTube channel. All right, so without further ado, I will now turn things over to Rhonda. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, what you see here, the photo is probably the most iconic photo of four courts in 1922 uh, after the bomb when it was literally ablaze and on fire. Uh, for the purposes of today's uh, lecture, we are going to look at specific areas uh, that lead up to that Four Courts fire. So we're going to start with Irish history, then I'll talk a bit about the Four Courts building. Uh, we'll talk about the records that were housed there, uh, not in great minute detail, but to give you an overview. Then we will talk about that fateful day, the 30th of June, 1922. We'll talk about the record alternatives we have had to uh, turn our attention to, uh, to replace the ones that were lost in the explosion. And then I will talk briefly about the new digital restoration endeavor. So first up is Irish history. Uh, and the Irish history, you may be thinking, oh, we're just going to launch right into 1922. I feel like it's very, very important that we understand the Irish history with England in general, because it plays a major role in what happens in 1922. So England's involvement in Ireland traces back to the Anglo-Norman invasion of the 12th century. That's a few hundred years ago. Uh, but there seems to be a lot of contention between the Irish and the English from that time forward, with some of those revolts and rebellions listed here the Confederate War that was in 1641 to 53, the Irish Rebellion of 1798, the 1803 Irish Rebellion, the Young Islander, Irelander Rebellion of 1848, the Fenian Rising in 1867, and the Easter Rising in 1916. 
if you are really interested in Irish history, I really recommend the Oxford Companion to Irish History, edited by S.J. Connolly. It's arranged alphabetically like an encyclopedia. And what I love is that it, it identifies cross references with uh, asterisks before the word that is also in this book. Uh, and it includes a lot of citations to various historical publications uh, and other resources that might give you a greater detail on whatever the topic is that you looked up. For the purposes, though, of today, we the Easter Rising is really where today's story kind of begins. Uh, the Easter Rising obviously was Easter week in 1916, and it was followed by the Irish War of Independence just after World War I ended that lasted from 1919 to 1921. It, uh, that was in roughly about July of 21. It took them five months to, uh, for both sides, England and Ireland, to agree on what became known as the Anglo-Irish Treaty in December of 1921. With this treaty, uh, there was a, the inception of Ireland's provisional government, and they were actually elected officially on 14 January 1922. 15 April 1922 is actually when the anti-treaty IRA take over Four Courts building. We'll get into more detail on that uh, as we go forward. And then the Battle of Dublin was June 28th to the 30th in 1922, with the explosion taking place on June 30th. So let's take a look at the Four Courts building. Believe it or not, the Four Courts building uh, has been occupied prior to the 1922 seizure. It was also occupied during the Easter Rising of 1916, and it did take, you know, there was some battling, but it didn't get destroyed in that particular one. But for whatever reason, they seem to like occupying and seizing four courts. I think it was because it's just such a massive complex of buildings and it was a, a way to be protected. The four courts uh, building itself was completed in 1802 and it was originally uh, designed to house the four superior courts of the time. There was the Chancery, the King's Bench, the Exchequer, and the Common Pleas, which is kind of where it gets its name, Four Courts, because there were these four superior courts. In 1867, there is the Public Records Ireland Act that gets passed that actually creates the public record office. And basically this was, the intention was to collect administrative court and probate records that were over 20 years old from all over the Ireland, deposit them in this one location, the public record office, so that they would be preserved and kept safe. In 1873, there was an amendment to this act that extended the protection of records to the Church of Ireland. Uh, in 1873, the Church of Ireland was no longer the church by law. And so there was some concern about the records and how they were being uh, housed and where they were being housed. And so it was intended to bring them in and protect them as well. It also established a master of the rules who was in charge of controlling and protecting the records. As we look at the act to provide for sa the keeping safely the public records of Ireland, which is the act of 1867, one of the uh, paragraphs starts out with, and whereas a large and commodious building has been erected in the neighborhood of the four courts in Dublin for the purpose of serving as a public record office. So the building had already been built before the act was passed, and they knew that this is what the, the building was going to uh, be used to handle. The follow-up amendment in 1873, 
again, had to do with the, uh, keeping safely certain parochial records in Ireland. Now, you may be thinking certain parochial records in Ireland that may have something to do with all parishes of all denominations. No, this was specifically about the Church of Ireland. And as you can see, underlined in red in the second paragraph there, at the time when the Church of Ireland ceased to be established by law, and then it follows up with their main concern, which was many of the records are kept in unfit and unsafe buildings. So this was the reason that they extended the Public Record uh, Act to include the parish records of the Church of Ireland. So to give you an idea of the overall complex of four courts. Uh, you can see here a map of the four courts area. In the forward front along Kings in, in Key, you see the four courts building with its two pavilions. It's a very iconic looking building. To the left of, to the right of that, as, as if you were coming out of four courts, you would see the four courts hotel where a lot of individuals stayed. That was actually outside of the complex. Uh, the lit thin line that you see that kind of goes around all these buildings and kind of meets up with the street was the outer wall, shall we say, of the complex itself. I have circled here in red the public record office, which is actually broken up into two different buildings that we'll talk about in a minute. You'll also see that the land registry office was there, and then there was the headquarters block. All of these buildings will be taken over in 1922. So to give you a look at the uh, public record office before it gets destroyed, uh, as I mentioned, there were the two, uh, two buildings. The smaller building was known as the record house, and this was designed to uh, house offices and a reading room. So when people came in to look for records, they would come in through the kind of the, the doors that you see in the far left of this picture, uh, the little portico there, and they would go in. Uh, and there were also a uh, basement apartment for the person who was sort of in charge of taking care of all of this, etc. Behind that was the much larger record treasury, which is where the records themselves were stored. The idea being that they would be nicely protected in this lovely building. And between the two is what they called a fireproof link. Uh, it's sort of like the, the short, it's got like the, the shortest of the roofs in this group. And it was actually three meters, which is about nine feet, 10 inches of that was designed to protect should fire break out in the record house because again we're talking offices so they you know they had lamps etc and so this was designed to protect the record treasury should a fire break out in the record house and keep the records safe inside the record treasury I can't even imagine what it must have been like to walk through here because it just looks so fascinating. Each one of these levels, there were six levels, uh, had various records. And you can see that there are, you can see behind the gentleman who sort of has this little newspaper there, the records are behind him. And they were arranged, obviously, by a cataloging method, and then there was a way to go back and forth between the two, um, the two sides, and it had an open atrium in the center, which is where the light came from for this particular building. So let's talk a little bit about the records that were housed in this magnificent uh, record treasury, because sadly, a lot of them disappear. Uh, the records to be deposited according to the 1867 Act included the Court of Chancery, the Court of King's Bench, Queen's Bench, depending on who was the monarch at the time, Court of Common Pleas, Court of Exchequer, Probate and Admiralty Courts, uh, Wills in General, the former Court of the Prerogative, Census, Records, Maps, Books, Documents, that were in the Custom House building, uh, the Birmingham Tower, Plea Pipe and other roles, 
state paper department records and records of former courts, commissions, or public offices. Basically, if it was 20 years old, it was supposed to be deposited into the record treasury. And then of course, in 1873, we add the Church of Ireland records, which included the registries of baptism, marriage and burial, as well as diocesan and parochial minutes of proceedings, and then random papers, books, documents, uh, or registry of ordination or other diocesan and parochial matters of any public nature. Uh, so basically a lot of records were housed in this building. And when it came to the amendment bill, the master of roles was to take possession of those Church of Ireland records. However, he was also supposed to make, as you can see in the top set of red lines, he was supposed to cause a transcript or copy to be made of each of the said records. That copy was then, as the bottom set of red lines says, was supposed to then be turned over to whoever had the original records to begin with, whether it was the provincial or diocesan or united diocesan register, or to a parish or a parochial district, whoever had those original records was supposed to get a copy. And unfortunately, it was sort of like as soon as conveniently may be after the removal of the records to the, uh, to the record office. So unfortunately, not everything is going to get copied, but that was the goal so that there would actually be the originals protected in the, re the record treasury, and then a copy would still be with the actual parishes. The collections that have that were in and housed in the record treasury included census records, military records, details of law cases, court records, records of land transfers, medieval chancery rolls, and a whole bunch of other medieval records, including wills, writs, fines, letters, you name it. The medieval records were actually transcribed onto parchments, which were stored uh, then by being stitched together head to foot and then rolled up. So they were actually in rolls. It is said that the oldest document uh, that was actually in the record treasury on the 30th of June, 1922 was a papal grant of 916 AD that created the chapter of Christ Church in Dublin. Uh, there were also letters and legal documents from the time of Henry II. And a more modern item was the 149 volume set of the manuscript journals of the Irish Lords and Commons. And it was an elaborate set that was bound in crimson Morocco leather with each volume lavishly tooled in gilt. So no amount of expense was spared on creating that 149 volume set. And unfortunately, it disappears and is blown up. One of the reasons that we know so much about what was actually in the public record office in 1922 is because Herbert Wood, who was the assistant deputy keeper of the public records for Ireland, created a guide to the records that were deposited in the public record office. And he did this and it was published in 1919. It is a 300 plus page volume that identified in detail all the records that were housed at the record treasury up to that point. The uh, table of contents at the front shows just, this is just one page of that table of contents and it shows details of things from the taxing office, the judgment office, those various courts I mentioned about exchequer chamber, admiralty, uh, insolvency. Uh, one of the big ones is the encumbered and landed estates and land judges courts, et cetera. And then I have put a little red arrow next to the diocesan registries, which was part of the ecclesiastical and testamentary collections in general. And this shows you that it is 30 pages of these registries and what was included in them. So if we look at one of these particular uh, 
pages. Here is for the diocese, the diocese of Armagh records. And you can see among other things that we have, uh, you know, building charge applications, uh, clergy residents and returns, council privy acts from 1637 to 1861, deeds, leases, all sorts of stuff as to the uh, care and treatment of the, you know, the Glebe house and, and more. There were registries of, of certificates of rent and tons and tons of items and a manor that was in the estate of Armagh that had been granted in 1614. If we continue on in this particular page, you can see even more, uh, again, leases, maps, uh, tithe composition papers, the valuation books, which are about mostly the buildings and things. Uh, but then we get down to the visitation papers, the parochial returns that started in 1786 and went to 1871. And this is what would have included entries of the baptisms, marriages, and burials, which were made by the clergy who then returned them to the bishop at his visitation. Another page out of this particular volume, uh, this in the military records shows that the officers' widows' pensions uh, were, for, it was originally established in Ireland in 1711. Now, granted, not everybody had an officer that their ancestor was married to. However, there were accounts of payments, there were certificates, which included affidavits um, proving that you know, the applicants were lawfully married to their husbands. Can you imagine having access to that in the 17, mid 1700s if you knew that your ancestor had married an officer? Uh, imagine having that at your fingertips to allow you to pursue your ancestors in early, you know, earlier into the 1700s, especially if they were Church of Ireland. So the occupation of four courts, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, takes place on 15 April 1922. The anti-treaty IRA uh, enter and seize the four courts. And they do so because they feel, they believe that because they are a military establishment that they deserve to have better offices than where they were previously uh, residing and taking care of business within Dublin. And one of the things that you can see is the in the photograph in the very back at the very top, you will see sandbags in the windows. So they were already barricading this building with the understanding that there could possibly be trouble. And in this very detailed newspaper article, they uh, it also at the very sort of as an afterthought, very last paragraph of that particular uh, full page article mentions public records of almost inestimable value are kept in one of the buildings of the four courts. And it is hoped that there will be no interference with them. The idea of protecting the records is a big deal to certain individuals. Obviously those who had previously been in the, uh, been in the buildings, who were now kicked out of the buildings, they were concerned about the records. Uh, there were others who were concerned as well. And so there's a lot of communication that goes back and forth as the anti-treaty IRA are in the buildings. Rory O'Connor, who is a leader of the anti-treaty IRA forces in four courts, assures the newspapers that those in the four courts will safeguard the records in the public record office. Not sure what he was thinking because as we get forward into the Battle of Dunbar, or Dunbar, the Battle of Dublin, uh, things were already in motion. So 30 June is the day, but let's lead up to that because there's a lot that's going on from that moment when they walk in and seize the building on 15 April. First thing is they seize the four courts and for whatever reason, the provisional government allows the men to remain in four courts. They don't 
go to them and say, hey, you've got to get out. They don't cause them any problems. During the month of May, anti-treaty IRA continue to fortify the area. They also have been uh, running around the countryside stealing things that they need, whether it be food, uh, cars, uh, you know, ammunition, et cetera. And they are going to turn some of those buildings into storage facilities and or factories for certain things. So between May and June, the hostilities continue. But once again, Michael Collins and his provisional government do nothing to expel the men from four courts. Now, this could have something to do with the fact that the National Army isn't quite yet up to uh, being able to really take on possibly the anti-treaty IRA, and a lot of the British soldiers have left already. On 16 June, the pro-treaty Sinn Féin party win the elections for the very first time. And this is one of the contributing, sort of like our stepping off point with what's going to happen and ultimately cause problems. So once again, looking at the map, this time with certain items identified, uh, despite Rory O'Connor's assurances, it was proven that the anti-treaty IRA had decided to use the ground floor of the record treasury as a munitions factory uh, under the direction of Frank Cotter. So they bring in lathes and other machinery to create mines and other uh, types of munitions. And the, the men within the complex begin to refer to the record treasury as the munitions block. It's never a good thing to hear when you've got valuable records in a building. Uh, so they are on the bottom floor of that six floor record treasury, creating things that go boom. Now they were storing them in the headquarters area. And so, but there's really not a lot of space between the two buildings. After everything happens and the fires are out though, you can see in the picture that we're about to show that Number one, there's a lot of things that, that, you know, a lot of, you can see in the walls where they were literally fired on. Uh, but you can also see here in this uh, picture that they are literally looking at the bomb making uh, apparatus, or at least one of them in the building. Uh, so despite their assurances to the contrary about protecting the records, I'm not sure that it was really that big of a deal to them because of course obviously they are trying to fight the treaty they're trying to fight where Ireland is moving to and so as a result they're busy you know making things in the record treasury one of the big aspects that is really going to start to light the flame that, that causes everything that happens on the 28th was the assassination of Sir Henry Wilson on the 22nd of June 1922. He was a well, you know, he was involved with Ireland for a long time. He was a <clears throat> he was actually in London at his, his home in London when he is assassinated. This upsets Winston Churchill and the British cabinet who demand the provisional government in Dublin take action against Four Courts Garrison. In fact, Churchill is so upset, he is ready to uh, issue this ultimatum that he wants published and he wants the British forces to go in and just take over. Meanwhile, the uh, a, one of the, leaders of the anti-treaty group is uh, arrested. He has, uh, he is involved in the stealing of yet more cars to help the anti-treaty guys. And as I mentioned, up until this point, they have been able to do whatever they wanted without any pushback. This particular time, they go to a showroom and they go to steal a bunch of cars and the National Army comes and arrests everybody involved. In retaliation for that, the Four Courts troops arrest 
uh, the Free State, Pro, Free State Pro Treaty General and Deputy Chief of Staff, J.J. Ginger O'Connell, on the 26th of June, 1922. This is actually going to become the final straw for Collins and the provisional government, in large part because all of this is leading up to the fact that Collins knows that if this continues, Britain is going to continue, consider the Anglo Irish Treaty null and void, and they're going to come barreling right back in. So now he feels he's got to respond. On the 27th of June, Collins and his provisional government cabinet issue an ultimatum to the Four Courts garrison that they must evacuate. Now, this is issued late in the evening. Uh, in the early hours of 28 June, really, I think, before anything could be done or any back and forth could maybe have worked out a truce, the National Army commences bombardment of the four courts from across the River Liffey. Uh, this includes two 18-pounder field guns that have been loaned to the National Army from uh, the, Brit the Brits. And then on 29 June, uh, IRA Commandant Patrick O'Brien is injured with shrapnel from a result of the pounding that the buildings are taking. And Director of Operations Ernie O'Malley takes charge. What's interesting about uh, O'Malley is the fact that, number one, he was part of this group that was in four courts uh, and involved with the anti-treaty IRA. And he actually writes a book. It's one of three that he does uh, called The Singing Flame. And it's his take on what leads up to it and what happens during the hostilities from the 28th to the 30th of June. Going back to this iconic photo, photo of the battle uh, and the burning of four courts, uh, Ernie O'Malley actually described the explosion in this manner. As we stood near the gate, there was a loud shattering explosion. The pillars of the gate shook. A blast of air seemed to rock about us. I was thrown heavily against the iron bars and fell to the ground. The munitions block, AKA, the record treasury, and a portion of the headquarters block went up in flames and smoke. Large pieces of stone and wood crashed around us. Papers feathered down. I had seen the sky behind me as I fell, yellow-white topped with the dark balloons of smoke. The Irish Independent announces on July 1st the dramatic end of the siege, because eventually on the 30th, the anti-treaty IRA are going to uh, surrender, at least within the four courts. Uh, and they talk about everything that happens. And they believe that the cause of the big explosion is a mine that was in the, the record, the treasury, the record treasury that is set off. And so they feel like that's why everything blows up. One of the subsections of that uh, I, independent newspaper talks about the fact that the explosion goes off at 12.30 p.m. And it mentions that the you know, volumes of smoke proceeded from the building and piles of charred documents were blown high into the air and carried with the wind all over the center of the city. And so here is one of the photographs of individuals picking up some of the pieces of documents that are ultimately will come back down due to gravity. And, you know, the, the historic records, which can never be replaced. O'Malley went on to describe in his book about what was going on. He said a thick black coat the cloud floated up about the buildings and drifted away slowly, fluttering up and down and against the black mass were leaves of white paper. They looked like hovering white birds. A half burnt broken volume fell at my feet. I picked it up. An account of the Secret Service money paid by Dublin Castle to informers in the year 1798. I thought, in a hundred years time, will the new records office contain an account of the Secret Service money paid out in 1922? Now, I actually reached out to the National Archives to find out 
uh, and quoted this, this line from his book. And I asked them about the informers of the year 1798, which is why that rebellion failed miserably because there were informants and the Brits knew all about what was going on. Uh, and I asked, had there, was there possibly, you know, a list of informers during, from 1922 and earlier timeframes. And I was told that number one, they did not appear to have the surviving uh, pieces of the volume from 1798 and that there was no similar volume from 1922. Uh, so, who knows what happened? What I can tell you, though, is that I, I back in 2006, Enna Clan, which is a company that worked with a lot of different repositories in Ireland, actually made six, a six DVD set of what was called the Dublin Castle Special Branch Files. Uh, it was basically intelligence on over 400 individuals who were said to be involved in Sinn Féin and the various IRA uh, groups, hoping to obviously create a separate Republican, you know, a Republic of Ireland. And the dates for this are 1899 to 1921. This six CD set is actually kind of interesting because it's the actual, there are PDF files, but they're actually information uh, the, the whole case file. Uh, and you get information on how old people were, what they were being watched for, etc. cetera. Uh, so you may want to see if you can find that somewhere. You never know. Uh, it isn't just the, the major players like Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins. There's a lot of just average Joes who, you know, said something they shouldn't have and somebody tells on them. So you may find some information on your ancestors there as well. One of my favorite books about the Battle of the Four Courts and all of its destruction is Michael Fuhrer's uh, book, The Battle of the Four Courts, The First Three Days of the Irish Civil War. As I mentioned, the newspapers called, uh, called it a mine that exploded in the PRO. Uh, Fuhrer says, no, they would not have stored the mines where they were making the munitions. And so while there may have been something that set off everything, it was not because a mine was set off in the building. However, I know that from Ernie O'Malley's take on things, they were not above doing that because they felt like that was their card to play. We'll blow up all your precious documents if you don't back off. So because we have lost all of this valuable records, what kind of alternatives do we as genealogists have at our fingertips today? Well, in the first case, there are some things that did survive, including a number of court record collections. In the chancery, there's the role of uh, justiciary pleadings. In the sixth and seventh years of Elizabeth II and statute roll of the, 20, uh, the 28th year of Henry VIII. This is how they uh, catalog things. is based on the year of reign of a particular monarch. Uh, there were chancery bills largely between 1550 and 1630 that have survived. Exchequer memoranda rolls from the third year of uh, Elizabeth II and the 13th and 14th year of her and a few inquisitions in the time of Henry VIII. Not going to lie, I'd totally like to see this. Uh, and uh, as far as the common police court goes, there is nothing earlier than the late 18th century, so the late 1700s that survived. What didn't survive is basically the things that we as genealogists use the most. This includes the census records from 1821 to 1851. However, the surviving fragments have been abstracted and are now searchable and viewable on the National Archives of Ireland website. The Church of Ireland parish records that were so dangerously in bad housing, et cetera, uh, there was actually close to a thousand parishes that were in the PRO at the time the building uh, went up in flames. And so those unfortunately have kind of gone poof. And then there was probate records, major gaps between uh, pre-1858 uh, and 
the 57, 58 is when things changed and the probate stops being handled by what's known as the prerogative court, which was actually a church court and starts being handled by a civil court. And so things are divided by pre-1858, which is the prerogative court wills, et cetera. And then the post-1857 wills and other records that are the civil records. And there are major gaps in these records. When it comes to especially the probate, uh, John Grenham's Tracing Your Irish Ancestors and now in its fifth edition is by far uh, my go-to in figuring out what survives. And he also gives a lot of detail on all the different records that we use as genealogists, church, et cetera. And he talks a lot about where you may go for alternatives. So if you haven't gotten this and you are researching your ancestors, this isn't a beginner's book on just how to trace you know, the beginnings of your Irish ancestors. It is an extensive book that gives lots of useful information. Also, he has taken to uh, the web in large part, I think, because pretty much with a book, as soon as you publish it, especially because of everything on the internet and how things change, it almost becomes obsolete, obsolete as soon as we publish it. And so he has a website where you can do some things for free, but it is a subscription site. I highly encourage you to uh, subscribe because you get lots of useful information about specific civil parishes. And as you can see here, I've highlighted in uh, with red arrows, some of the types of records that you might want to be looking at. So in other words, 13 census type records, obviously not the censuses. These are alternatives that may offer you some of the same info. 10 church records. So he's going to tell you about where they are, etc. And then 46 will records. And there's lots of other things he has on his website. Uh, if you are researching Irish ancestry, definitely you're going to you need to go there. So let's talk a little bit about the alternatives for those three major groups that we as genealogists would really love to have resurrected. For the census alternatives, for, uh, we have three major collections. There is what's known as the tithe plotment books that were taken at least once between 1823 and 1838 for most parishes. Some actually have a second one. Then there's Griffith's primary valuation, which was actually taken between 1848 and 1864, and then the revision books themselves. So we're going to look at each one of these individually. Now, the tithe plotment record that was taken in the early 1800s was a tax on one tenth of the production of a piece of land. The tithe plotment survey, which is the books that we're looking at here, and this one happens to be from the Diocese of Kilala, were begun in 23. They rated the productivity of the land from one to four. So you can see here we have the town land, then we have a name of the occupier. In this case, our top man here is Andrew Malley. And the quantities and detail of his, the next three columns, takes the land and breaks it down into uh, acres, roots, and perches. That's what that ARP at the top means. Uh, so his land is broken down into quantities, and then it is rated. And the, uh, the, I, the land is identified as being either uh, one, which was very good land, therefore should be producing a lot, down to four, which was very poor, and thus couldn't produce a lot. And so your charge on that, like if it was a bog or something, would be much less. It's a two page spread. And on the second page, we see additional the quantities and holding, et cetera. And then we see the amount uh, for the tithe. And then in this case, in the observations, it's literally saying who the money is going to go to. And this was the problem because the tax was being paid to the local church of Ireland by those who were being taxed in the parish, regardless of their religious denomination. So in Ireland, you have a civil parish, which is not attached to the churches in general, although it does tend to coincide 
with the Church of Ireland parish, but then you also had like a Catholic parish, etc. nearby. Well, everyone, regardless of religious denomination, was being taxed. Uh, and then this money was being turned over to the Church of Ireland, the state church, for its support. So you can see how that may not have been too popular among those of the Catholic faith and also the Presbyterian faith, because in large part, they were uh, being denied certain rights and abilities, uh, especially in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, because they were not of that state supported religion. In 1848, uh, Richard uh, Griffith, who has been tasked with a few things. He's come from Scotland where he's sort of done an ordnance survey uh, in 1805, 1806-ish time period of Scotland. And now he's being tasked with doing something similar in Ireland. And it's a two-part thing. The first thing is he's going to identify the area. In other words, the lands themselves. And then he is going to follow that up with what we know of as the valuation, which is identified by parish. So you have the civil parish, which is the parish of Ballinrobe here. And then you have the town lands within that civil parish. And then each individual who is an occupier of a particular piece of property along with who the immediate lesser is, in other words, who has ownership or is leasing the land, then you get a description of the tenement. It could be land, it could be a house, it could be something as tiny as a shack, uh, etc. And then you have the area and the rateable area valuation. So you and so this took a number of years. He started in 1848. It was not actually fully completed until 1864. But what he did was, in addition to identifying everybody, the furthest left column identifies where on those ordnance survey maps the piece of property was. If you use his information on askaboutireland.e, my personal favorite for Griffith's valuation. You can see here we have Andrew Malley in Ballin Robe, and we have the original page from Griffiths, and then we have the OSI, the Ordnance Survey uh, of Ireland map options as well. So if we look at the Griffiths valuation page, we can see here's Andrew Malley in Ballin Robe, uh, Obviously, the land is under the lease of Colonel Charles Knox. It's a land house and offices. And at the far left, we see that in Cloonkerry in Ballin Robe, we are going to find that the piece of property that Andrew Malley has is the 13B. So 13 has was divided into two sections. One is John Malley, who's just above Andrew there in the list, and B is Andrew's piece of property. Going back to the index entry, we would then click on the OSI link, and it will take us to a map that you do have to zoom into and kind of play around with. Basically gives you two blocks and says that the land is somewhere in there. And here we can see 13 with the two uh, sections for uh, Clune Carey. The revision books are my personal favorite. Um, now they are certainly a more contemporary resource. They began in 1866. And what's great about them, if you can see the original digitized images is that they are color coded by year. So as somebody leaves uh, and somebody else takes over either as lesser or as occupier, names are crossed out and new information is put in. And then over in the far right, in the observations column, you have years that are done in the color of the ink to give you an idea of when people are either dying, leaving, whatever. Uh, and so that can be very useful in moving forward, especially in the you know, 1860s, 70s, 80s time period when a lot of our Irish ancestors were coming to America. The church alternatives are a little less uh, 
great. There may be transcripts, those copies available that you know were done after the records were turned over to the record treasury. Uh, Understand, though, for Church of Ireland, the records tend not to exist for a parish before 1634. There were uh, recommendations that they should be keeping them earlier than that, uh, but it was not, it was sort of a, yeah, yeah, I know you want me to do that, but I'm not going to do it. 1634, there was, they really started to get, as they, as an entity, yes, you must start to keep these records. Also, the marriages in the Protestant denominations tend to only go up to 1844, because after that, the civil registration of Protestant marriages took over. There is an excellent resource that was published in the Deputy Keeper of the Public Records, Volume 28. It's actually Appendix 2. And it was published in 1896, and it identified the Church of Ireland parishes, the, dioce the diocese it was part of, the county it was part of, how many volumes existed, and then you can see the baptism, marriage, and burial dates that, sir, that, were, uh, that existed. Those that were in the public record office are in the bold type. And those that are in traditional type, like straight type, um, are those that were uh, attached to local custody. In other words, they were still part of the local parish, et cetera. And then they do have some that you see that are in italics. These are usually cross-referenced with another parish's name. That list, while a wonderful resource, uh, there's actually a more contemporary version of this list of Church of Ireland. Uh, it's unfortunately got a very, very long URL, but you can see it there. So you can, uh, it, it, you know, when you're rewatching the recording, you can write that down. It's also linked within the uh, syllabus if you purchase the syllabus. Uh, it's a color coded resource for the Church of Ireland parish registers. This thing is amazing and you can download it for free. Uh, the color coding talks about uh, were the, are the records in the representative church body library in Dublin? Does Prony have them? Are they completely lost due to the fire in 1922, uh, etc. And then there is a symbol to keys. So here you can see on this page uh, what one of those pages looks like. The parish church or chapel is listed on the left. It's highlighted in whatever the color is. So as a reminder, the yellow means that it is at the, uh, the representative church, uh, the library. So you may be able to get access to some of those records there. The green is completely lost. There appears to be no option. And the purple is the ones that are part of Prony. Uh, and then over to the far right, there are links to places like Roots Ireland, uh, irishgenealogy.ie. Uh, those are the two main ones that they have included in this collection. Uh, the, the item itself is prop about 100 pages or more. The probate records, as I mentioned, John Grenham's volume uh, about tracing your Irish ancestors is my go-to for probate uh, surviving probate. He includes years. He also includes where the records can be found. Uh, he includes a lot of URLs or what we call uh, tiny URLs if it's something long. Uh, and you can just type in that tiny URL and it'll take you right to what you need. Again, he's broken it up for pre-1858 and post-1870, 1857. He also, as I mentioned on his website, has put a lot of information there. And you see here that we have the National Archives card index that's mentioned that includes all the records that were collected uh, after 1922, along with extensive collections of abstracts and transcripts that were done prior to when uh, the record treasury blew up. So to give you an idea, 
the index itself is available on family search. It's available for viewing from home. You don't have to go anywhere special to look at it. Uh, it is uh, eight microfilm reels that have now been digitized. And the when you get into it, you will see cards that look similar to this one here for John Matthews. And there is going to be some identification as to where they're getting this information from. So this is a, you know, a probate from 1743. It says the thrift abstracts. Uh, at the time, I wasn't sure what that meant. I Googled that. Google is my friend. I do all sorts of things when I'm not sure what I'm looking for. That turned me to another collection in family search that was of the thrift abstracts named for Gertrude Thrift, who went in and abstracted these wills prior to the destruction of the, the public record office in 22. While these are not searchable, if you use them in conjunction with that index, you can then get to the documents in question, uh, again, available from home through family search. The digital restoration is a new project. It was begun in nine, uh, 2018. The website is beyond 2022 IE, and it will be officially launched on the 30th of June, 2022. It is in partnership with between the uh, National Library or the National Archives and Trinity College Dublin. And among other things, if you, the thing that's most important is if you go to the Explore, you will see the sort of sub menu here. Again, it's not really operational right now, but you can see a couple of things. The first thing is the entry to the digital collections, which will be launched on the 30th of June. They have this virtual recreation of the public record office and you will enter through and you will actually be able to supposedly go up the stairs in the record treasury and pull a book off one of those floors, uh, off the shelves of one of the floors. So as I mentioned, it's a virtual record treasury that they are trying to recreate uh, with digital copies of many records destroyed in the explosion of fire of, in 1922. They basically have been seeking copies of records from around the world because there were some published volumes that were they found in other places, et cetera. Will everything be recreated? No, unfortunately not. But I can't wait to see it launched to see just what they have, you can get a sense of a few of the collections that they've made available uh, on the website, including, uh, you know, there's information about what they're doing. There's the Library of Dublin Castle, which was a man manuscript that they found at Harvard in Boston. There's the Dublin Gazette, which dates back to the 1700s and other items as well. And here you see the Dublin Gazette, which this one will happen to be printed in 1690. So in review, the Four Courts Fire of 1922 destroyed many records uh, and we will never be able to recreate them all. There may be copies or abstracts that uh, were housed elsewhere that might uh, offer you some insight as well as record alternatives that give at least part of the picture for you, if not the whole picture. And like I said, the technology is offering a new life to the record treasury and I myself am super excited for its launch. All right, well, thank you, Rhonda. So before we get to your questions, um, I do wanna tell you about a few upcoming programs. So starting on July 6th, Rhonda will be leading a four week online course on researching French Canadian ancestors. On Thursday, July 7th, David Allen Lambert will present an online lecture on researching uh, War of 1812 veteran ancestors. And if you're new to genealogy, maybe you wanna refresh your skills or just become a better researcher, be sure to join us for our three week online course on building your genealogical skills. There are just a few spots uh, remaining for that online program, and you can learn about all of these programs at AmericanAncestors.org slash events. So as I said, uh, we'll have some time for your questions. Um, Rhonda, one question that's come up quite a bit uh, are in regards to Roman Catholic records. So first of all, were those housed in the records office? 
No, they were not. This is one of the situations where it's good to be Catholic. Uh, those were still housed with their parishes. And in fact, the uh, National Library of Ireland has put all of their surviving uh, Catholic registers digitized online for free. Now, one person asks, so were Catholics, did Catholics ever have to register their baptisms, marriages, or deaths at a Church of Ireland um, parish? And therefore, would those have been, you know, um, destroyed? So there were the there were some laws in the late 1700s, early 1800s that did cause some issues where uh, Catholics were not, in other words, the ministers and priests were not allowed to legally marry people if you were not Church of Ireland. Uh, so some individuals' marriages may have been in the Church of Ireland records. It's possible you can find them in both places. Uh, they, you know, like I said, these penal laws existed and they did cause some conflicts to be sure. Um, again, you can maybe compare what your, your Catholic parish would be with the that Church of Ireland list and see if the records survive uh, were still housed in the original uh, parish, et cetera. Um, Michael asks, were ordinance survey maps uh, deposited at the um, you know, at the four courts? Uh, so they may have been in the land registry office, which somehow managed to avoid being blown up, et cetera. Uh, I'm not sure how, but it did. It survived pretty well. Uh, and all of the, the the ordinance survey maps have all been digitized. And you can find those on askaboutireland.ie. Uh, they're not easy to use. As I mentioned, the easiest, the best way to do, use them is in conjunction with the with Griffith's valuation, because it does allow you to link to the, you know, to do a search on your person, and then you don't have to pull out the fiche. We have the fiche at our research center in Boston, but this allows you to go straight to a colored version as opposed to a black and white version of the ordinance survey. And what it does is it, it, it's zoomed out considerably, and it shows you these two rectangular boxes with a circle around it. And the idea is that somewhere in that area is the piece of property you're interested in. It takes a little getting used to. Uh, my, get, my recommendation is to kind of zoom in until you can read the names of the places first, and then look in greater detail and zoom in further for the actual piece of property once you've identified your, your parish uh, and your townland. Um. No, Wendy says, presumably the records at the four courts uh, encompass the Republic of Ireland as well as what's now Northern Ireland. Is that true? So, um, you know, F County Down, for example, would those have been lost at the four courts fire? Uh, some of the records, yes, mm -hmm. because everything was supposed to be deposited in four courts. Um, a few people are also just going back to the Catholic records. Um, where do you find them? Uh, is it the national? What's the website? Can you just say a little bit more about those? Sure. So the uh, they, they have a very short URL. It's easy to remember. Registers.nli.ie. And then from there, you can type in the the name of the parish in question that you're searching, and they will tell you uh, what records uh, serve like what they have there it's you can't type in a name you do have to browse them but if you know a specific year that you're interested in they do have a way for you to pick a type of record if it's a, like has both for baptisms and marriages and then a specific year and it will at least take you to the page for that um now what about um let's see judith asks is there a census substitute that may cover my ancestors in ireland between 1864 and 1901 uh, your best bet is the revision books okay and those are so for, if you're in northern ireland prony has all of those online uh, again you can't type in a person's name but you can uh find a place and go through them that way uh, with the Republic of Ireland, they're currently only available at the valuations office in Dublin. 
Um, let's see, maybe a few other questions. Um, Teresia asks, what, uh, where would you look for pre-1800 records? So even earlier than uh, some of the substitutes that we've discussed. So a lot depends on your ancestors. Uh, both the National Archives in Dublin and Prony up in uh, Belfast have a lot of the landed estate records that may be your only resource. Because remember, most of us are, defended, are descended from those who were dirt poor. And so somebody was given like the Ulster Plantation, which kind of encompassed most of Northern Ireland. That was broken up into to, to, uh, manners, et cetera, that then somebody of import then was would enter into agreements to allow you to um, you know, live there, rent, et cetera. Uh, and so the landed estate records are very, very important in the earlier time frame, uh, in large part because they were kept locally. They did not end up in the public record office. And number two, the way leases were done in that time frame uh, were largely in uh, lives. So you may have three lives, and it might mention a grandfather, a father, and a son uh, by name in the actual deed. Again, these records are, are they're voluminous. You have to figure out which landed estate was the, would probably apply to you. Again, use John Grenham's website for that. And then you would have to physically go to either Prony in Belfast and or uh, the National Archives in Dublin to view those records and go through them uh, to look at the leases. So it sounds like in general, you know, Irish genealogy is not impossible. You just have to be creative, tenacious, persistent, um, and really think outside the box. You really do. Um, you know, in, in this kind of, you know, internet world, we're very, we've gotten very lazy. We're used to typing in a name, and if we don't find it, we give up. Irish research is always going to be a little more difficult because you have to look at these manuscript records that, number one, it's going to, you know, take forever to digitize everything, and that's costly, uh, both in man hours to do it, but also in, you know, where you store all those digital images so that they're really viewable when you need to get down to the nitty gritty. Personally, I love going to the archives and just looking at these records and touching these, these you know, ancient records and really understanding your history is also very, very important. This is one of the countries where you have to understand what was going on and who had control of the area in which your ancestor lived. All right, well, thank you again, Rhonda. Um, so as I mentioned at the start of the program, this has been recorded. You can watch or review the presentation on our website as well as our YouTube channel. It will be posted later today. There's also a syllabus that you can purchase from our online bookstore. Uh, that link is in your reminder email and it will also be included in the follow-up email that we'll send out later tonight. But that has more information about the history, um, many of the links that were discussed, uh, information on the alternatives, and much, much more. So take advantage of that. So I just want to thank you again for uh, joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback as we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings. Any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. This free webinar was made possible by the generous support of members and friends around the world. Please consider making a gift to American ancestors to keep these programs free and to create more free programs for you and others. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.